them there. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, and thanks for coming this evening. My name is Don Rice, and I am the um, board president here of the nonprofit at the Dyke Farmhouse Museum Alliance. I've lived in this neighborhood over 20 years, and I've always been attracted to this place and uh, volunteered here as, as the chairman of the board. So, uh, and I'm the history guy. I've been doing a lot of history research for the last 15 or so years, and just this year, I kind of felt like I was ready to tackle the Revolutionary War, which is sort of integral to this family's history in the neighborhood. But my day job was not as a historian, and I wanted to make sure that my research chops were up to snuff. And I think I've got something really good for it tonight. This is uh, draws from all kinds of amazing new sources that uh, some, some of these images we haven't even seen before. Oh, I've seen them, but these are new finds from a museum in Canada. All right, we're talking about the second part of the American Revolution in this neighborhood, 1777 to the end of the war, 1783. In June, we gave a talk about just 1776 and the lead up to the Battle of Fort Washington on November 16th. So that was a new very, that was a very eventful rich year. So that was the first talk. And this is the rest of the war. What was going on? Uh, we kind of think of the Revolutionary War as 1776, and then it's over, and then the Constitution, or you know, that kind of thing. But a lot was going on up here. Uh, soldiers were living up here for the remaining six years of the war after 1776 was over. A lot was happening. And so that's what we're going to talk, talk about. All right. But we got to set some limits. So everything tonight is going to happen have happened within five miles of where we are now. So I drew a, I went to Google Maps and drew a circle five miles wide around inward. So we're going to go up as far as Yonkers, but maybe we'll venture beyond that a little bit. We're really not going to get as far down as Harlem, but that's within five miles. And then almost to Pelham Bay, it's about five miles away, and then into Jersey. Most of what we're going to be talking about is within a mile of us. But we'll do a quick recap of 1776. I wanted to show you this first. This is a, this, the left side of this panoramic sketch that was made by an artillery man who was fighting for the British on November 16th, 1776. He's standing about where the Bronx Community College is now, the Hall of Fame. And on that day, he drew a sketch of the attack of this neighborhood. So on the left, we can see some people with there's some cannons. That's for George Hill. On the right, the really interesting part of this sketch, which is a primary source, was done that day, is the, the Harlem River. He's, this is a black and white sketch. So this is the Harlem River and the houses that are along its shoreline. The original Dykeman family homes, the Nagel Estate, there's a street in the neighborhood called Nagel Avenue. There's Fort Tryon, and off to the right, you can see the New Jersey Palisades. This is a drawing that rewards close, uh, multiple looks. And it's been in a um, museum in Canada, virtually unknown until just a few months ago. The subject matter might look familiar, the artist didn't do a few paintings afterwards, and one of the versions of this piece is in the New York Public Library, and it's in color. Got his watercolors out, and he could be aided for that. So the recap is that after the disaster of November 16th, when um, the rebels lost in a day, one day battle to the British here for Washington, um, the rebels had two quick wins that helped their morale. The Battle of Trenton on December 26th and the crossing of the Delaware on Christmas night. Rebels beat the Hessian soldiers who had been hired by uh, the British. And then on January 3rd, the Battle of Princeton versus the British. These weren't huge battles, not on the scale of the one here in uh, Upper Manhattan, but they really did help the morale of the American soldiers moving forward. So this is what the Hudson River looked like looking upstream right in those days. This is another one of those Thomas Davies sketches that he did on plein air right at the site with the sketchbook. Tappan Zee Bridge would be right up here. 
it even says view of the Hudson River taken near Kingsbridge, looking up towards Tappan C S C K. And if you've ever been up to the top of Inley Hill at the top of Fort Fine and look north, the view is identical. And there's another one of his sketches that shows Inwood Hill Park. The Henry Hudson Bridge crosses here today with the New Jersey Palisades in the distance, and there's battleship on the on the Hudson River. And spine dive along the right. And a view from the New Jersey side, Fort Lee, looking across towards Fort Washington, right there, you can actually see the fort if you look at it closely enough. And then when he was stationed at Fort Washington, he did actual painting looking south with Manhattan on the left and New Jersey on the right from about 181st Street. Pretty cool. Almost more dangerous than muskets with smallpox. You can see John Adams writing to his wife, Abigail, the smallpox is 10 times more terrible than Britons, Canadians, and Indians together. And in February 1777, the general who is in charge of this neighborhood writes, the smallpox is making its appearance in the neighborhood. So smallpox had appeared. People are really worried that it can kill it can kill soldiers quickly, even if there's no battle, it's just the contagion. This became a really serious thing, and up that George Washington became very aware of it. And, and I was sort of shocked to see this, but on February 6th of 1777, uh, George Washington ordered smallpox inoculations of all the new troops as they came to Philadelphia. Inoculations was a very different thing in those days. You had to take the excretion of someone who has smallpox and rub it into, make a little wound on someone else, or rub this liquid onto someone you want to immunize. Then they would get a weak case of smallpox, but not a strong case of smallpox. And after that case is over, they're immune forever. George Washington immunized his wife, Martha, George Washington had been Im immune. He caught a mild case of smallpox in Barbados through the 1750s or something like that. Anyway, he thought it was such a threat to his soldiers that new soldiers, as they came online, basically, would be uh, immunized. So he says in his order from February of 1777. So hopefully, I mean, he was really concerned that he's short, he doesn't have a lot of soldiers anyway. And if smallpox depletes his, army, there's not much chance of winning. The other thing that is a large part of this strategy for the six years is this whole area above Inwood and below Croton. They called it the neutral ground. The rebels were all up here and the British were below and in between it was a no man's land. A no man's land of rich, productive farms. And these soldiers were hungry, they needed supplies constantly. So this became sort of like the, a, a raiding territory for, for uh, foraging parties. People living there were often older. I mean, if, if people could leave, they did, but not everybody could. So it became a real political push and pull of uh, who can take this neutral ground and who can't. Uh, the character of each uh, individual was described in code by, by the officers to know where the alliances of all these farmers were. People were exposed to depredations on each side. They feared everybody. Their houses were often scenes of desolation, furniture being plundered, cattle gone, enclosures, fencing burned. And the road, the main road up to Albany, uh, which used to be populated with carriages and business, Constant comings and goings are most, mostly empty. One general camped on a farm for six weeks, during the course of which his or the farmer's orchard was cut down. A thousand bushels of wheat were destroyed, and all of his hogs were killed for the army. And this just happened over and over again. So it became a very contested region. And Washington tried to take advantage of this. 
he was under undermanned. His army was a lot smaller than the British. And so he actually thought that he could use this neutral ground strategically. And if he were to raid the British from above, coming into the neutral ground, coming down towards Inwood, and fake battles, he could make the British reinforce this area, bring more soldiers, keep more soldiers, and those soldiers would be unable to fight George Washington where he really wanted to fight. So he would fake uh, attack here and, and try to get people to and try and get the British to overstaff neighborhood. A lot of the British who had been displaced were known as refugees, and they were people who were whose jobs were, were to go and get beef cattle and supply meat for the troops. And this guy, James Delancey, he wasn't really a soldier, but he was the head of the refugees, which were British, uh, British terrorists. Their raids were so successful that in 1780, General Washington ordered that they try to take Delancey as prisoner. So these refugees were just, they lived under the shelter of the fortifications in North Manhattan. There were forts with numbers, Fort Number 8, that's just across from 207th Street, Delancey's Mills, that's uh, just past the Jerome Reservoir, and Morsenia, that's the South Bronx. So this is where uh, British sympathizers could live, feel somewhat secure because they've got the Fort Washington, they've got Fort George, they have all of these cannons protecting them. The rebels formed this group called the Westchester Guides. There were really no maps in these days. And all these soldiers were coming from other places. And the roads are muddy. How do you get from place to place? So they hired some local kids, basically teenagers, young men in their early 20s who knew the neighborhood. Many of them had the last name of Dykeman, and they were hired by the army to lead, lead them here and there, wherever the army needed to go. Among the principal guys were the Dykeman brothers, Brom and Mike. They were the brothers of the guy who built this house, and their cousin William Nagel of Lower Yonkers. And this guy in the photograph was the youngest guy, Andrew Corsa. He was only like 16 in 1770. He lived until the 1840s or 50s, long enough to get his picture taken. So here's a photo of Andrew Corsa taken around 1851, the last of the guys to survive. But it's just amazing that this guy who fought in the Revolutionary War in this neighborhood, at least one person had their photo taken, lived long enough to have their photo taken. That's cool. We'll hear a little bit about him later. So Abraham, or Brom Dykeman, turned out to be a real hero. William Dykeman is the guy who built this farmhouse, and he had some brothers. He had sons, and Brom was the second of his sons. Jacobus was the first. And Brom was like this risk taker, uh, joyous, frank, open temperament. He really liked to fight and compete, and so, uh, from the commencement of the war, he was usually in this working in the service as a guide. He seemed to delight in danger. It actually ended up being the end of him. He was killed during the battle, during the Revolutionary War, during a skirmish. He was unnecessarily risky. Uh, but it kind of sounds like a guy you could make a TV show about. And there's a park called Brown Dykeman Park, just north of the Bronx border in Mount Vernon. His younger brother, Mike, was, of course, the opposite, an introvert, trying to keep his older brother in check, but, of course, idolizing him. They did a lot of skirmishes together during the Revolutionary War, and uh, he could never really rein in his older brother. But he lived. Okay, the first story we're going to talk about is the attack in January of 1777 in this neighborhood of uh, Fort Independence, up by the Jerome Reservoir, if you go up to Target, you know where Target is, 225th Street, you go up the hill, and right up there is the Jerome Reservoir, and that's where a number of British forts were. 
So one of the things that George Washington wanted to do in order to uh, bring more reinforcements, force the British to put reinforcements, was to fake an attack that he knew would probably not work. And so he writes to General Heath, move towards New York with a considerable force as if, he, as if he had a design upon the city. The enemy will be reduced to withdrawing part of their force from the Jerseys, where Washington was. Washington is asking for relief. Make them, make them move their soldiers to Inwood, and I'll have less soldiers to deal with here in New Jersey. So it, this is in the middle of the winter, about 4,000 rebels march towards Kingsbridge at 230th Street under, dark, under the cover of darkness. And Kingsbridge is right here. Kingsbridge used to be the land on and off the island. It's at about 230th Street, and Marble Hill is right below it. This is Fort Independence up by the Jerome Reservoir today. Anyway, the 4,000 troops caught everybody by surprise. They thought they that might actually have a shot at winning. They forced all of the British into the fort, and then the uh, Americans sent a note demanding surrender. But the British knew that uh, the, the odds were against the rebels. The next day, the rebels start bombarding Marble Hill. They set up cannons here. And then the next day on Spite and Dial Hill, problem was they didn't have big cannons, they didn't have many cannons, and they didn't have much in the way of ammunition. So they decided to try and surprise the British troops by crossing the frozen Spite and Dial Creek. Moving their troops across Spite and Dial Creek was cold enough until it started to rain. And the next day, they were unable to cross Spite and Dial Creek, and everything started to fall to pieces. Stormy weather started to move in. The ammo started to get soaked. Their biggest cannons, a 24-pound howitzer, a 24-pounder and a howitzer were ordered to fire upon the fort. But on the third discharge, charge, the 24-pounder, this one, sprung its carriage. The actual barrel of the cannon came off the wood. And then they forgot to get ammo for the howitzer. So it was all for show. It didn't really work. And so uh, on the 29th, a severe snowstorm was coming. There was no ammunition. There was no chance of winning. The only objective that the only thing that they, uh, the rebels could do would be to destroy food that the British had. So they withdrew under a heavy fall of snow, defeated by winter and lack of ammunition. And this, this is an original painting of George Washington, just joking. Uh, George Washington was ticked off because information traveled more slowly in those days. And he had just heard the good news about the first day of this assault that they had chased the British into the fort and uh, but he hadn't heard bad news yet. And so as he heard, he had already told his friends, hey, it looks like we're winning up in Inwood. So news of the plausible or possible success soon grew into a, re like a fish story that the rebels had reduced the fort and captured the garrison and it reached General Washington before he had made his official report. And he communicated, communicated the good news to Congress. And so he was embarrassed when he finally got the news. And he wrote this scathing letter to General Heath down on the lower right to Major General William Heath. This letter is in addition to my public one. It is a hint to you, and I do it with concern, that your conduct is fraught with too much caution, by which the army has been in some degree disgraced. Your actions were not only idle, but farcical, and will not fail of turning the laugh exceedingly upon us. He said, you made us a laughing stock. The thing, these things I mentioned to you as a friend, for you will perceive I have not put them in my public letter. Upon the whole, if you had pushed vigorously, you might have won. But what this told the British was that their, their fortifications at the top of the island weren't strong enough. And so they started to fortify uptown. Here on this map, we can see work begun. This is at uh, Marble Hill. We can see that it was work begun in January of 1777. 
fort number nine, and they started to call their all these satellite fortifications by numbers. Redoubts faith on 7077, that's a French word for built. And so these are uh, one, two, and three. One through nine, other improved British forts. All of these, these are in University Heights surrounding in which, so basically the British are building a wall around the tip of the island to keep people from this neutral zone or whatever you want to call it, from continuing to raid and cause trouble. Meanwhile, everybody needs food all the time. Both sides need food all the time. They need straw for bedding. They need straw for their animals. They're, the neighborhood was filled with these wagon trains going up to try and find stuff and bring it back if they were successful. Uh, some memoirs from, uh, I use a lot of diaries and a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff shows up here. And so February 1st, 777, February 3rd, February 8th, they call them grand forages, going up to steal stuff and maybe reimburse some of the farmers. So regarding this house, the family that built this house, um, the children of William Dyckman were, the eldest was Jacobus, and he's the guy who was, he lived in this house the longest. He was sort of the pragmatic guy. He attempted to compromise with the British at first. He tried to play both sides. He had these farms. He wanted to sell his livestock. And so he tried to sell to the British and to the Wells. And in order to sell to the British, he had to sign a loyalty oath to the king. And there's a record that he did. Fall of 77, the writer, one writer says, Abraham O'Dell and Jock the Steichman came to, up to White Plains and took an oath of allegiance to his majesty. Both have supplied his majesty's troops at Kingsbridge with beef, pork, wheat, corn, etc., and continue to do so. But, Jacobus, what? But later, he changed his tune and fought for independence alongside his brothers. So as the war progressed, both Odell and Jacobus found their earlier position untenable and cast their lot with the rebels. And Jacobus enlisted in a, volu in a volunteer cavalry and was later a private in the third Westchester County Redwood. So he had a change of heart. His brothers didn't have to have a change of heart. His brothers were just fighting for the brothers. So Brom is the hero, the type of man from whom legends grow and the manner of his death contributed to his fame. Friendly and well-liked, we mentioned him earlier. There's this big monument to him in Yorktown, New York, uh, brave to the point of recklessness. And he loved guerrilla warfare. He loved the exciting adventure of war. He didn't really see it as a, the risk that it was. Uh, eventually his daring brought about his death. That's towards the end of our story. Mike Dykeman, the third son, he was only 20 at the beginning of the revolution. He joined the militia and the Westchester Guides. And um, he continued until about 1780 when, and this is actually something that might have to do with the creation of this house. He received a friendly warning from the British refugee, James Delancey, that his activities against the loyalists could lead to retaliation against his family. So he made himself scarce and fought elsewhere and came back in July of 1781. So the Dykemans, with some of them are initially fighting for the, for the loyalists, but most of them fighting for the rebels, made enemies on both sides. William Dykeman Jr., the fourth son, he was just a kid, he was 13. They sent him up to live with his aunts. But when he was turned 16, he may have been a drummer boy. He started to volunteer. He started to scout. And after the war, he returned to Inwood with his father to rebuild their farm. So the four Dykeman brothers. There were sisters too. Rebecca Dykeman Odell and Margaret Dykeman Odell. Married, they married different Odells. Uh, they, lived, they both lived in uh, Westchester. And so they had to uh, deal with this constant harassment from both sides. The Odells of Rebecca Odell lived in the neutral ground and were victims of, was a victim of marauding dance of raiders. On one night, her husband refused to tell the raiders where he kept his money, and they started to hang him. She rescued his, her husband with a shovel. 
Get out of here. And uh, Margaret Odell Dykeman, her husband was captured near White Plains in 1776. And while he was in prison, the, camp, the enemy camped on their farm and destroyed it and carried off carried off a lot of property. We can talk about that. Six weeks, destroyed the orchards, killed the pigs. So life was hard. How did the Dykemans move from Inwood? They lived here for over, over 100 years or about 100 years before the war. Got to figure, um, they have cattle, they have other livestock, they have all kinds of tools and farm implements. They probably have a, a, a household supplies and all their grain and whatever it is that they think they can sell. They can only travel so far a day. They had to get above the, the, the neutral zone. And so they stayed, most likely, a woman, Dorothea Romer, wrote a paper in 1953 hypothesizing of all the relatives in Westchester where they could travel just 10 miles, 10, another 10, another 10, until they reached safety, safety where William Dykeman's sisters lived and there was a ferry nearby. So the Dykeman's probably spent a few, they probably weren't doing this every day, but they left in August, September, October 1776 before the battle and found several stopped at several places until they reached safety above the above the uh, Croton River. It would have been a slow journey. You know exactly where they landed? That's not known. But probably around Cortland. Their, uh, the King's Ferry was right up there. And William Dykeman's sisters lived just across the river, and he had a 13-year-old who was staying with them. So it's uh, probable that that's about where it was. I like to actually uh, research that more. I think that the area was in the Phillips state. Most of the area had after the Yonkers, the Chari town was part of what's called the Phillips state. Yeah. And Phillips was a loyalist. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so it sort of leads to this question. They had to leave the neighborhood. We know their house was destroyed. Was the Dyckman farm destroyed by the rebels or loyalists? This is the um, another version of that painting that we saw. Here we can actually see the Nagel residence that lasted until 1903-04. That was at 213th Street. That's also under the train yards now. And then at 209th Street, a few blocks downtown from there, were the Dykemans. This is the old Dykeman home, probably built in the 1600s. A newer one, because it became a multi-generational family at that farm. And then one other person, Courtright, another farmer in the neighborhood. You can see the track of the Kingsbridge Road. Broadway now comes travels up here. It used to travel right along the riverside of the Harlem River. So how do we find out when the, uh, uh, their homes were destroyed? By maps, I'm hoping. And so we'll look at a few maps here. This is from 1778, map drafted in 1778. Looks pretty reliable. If you zoom in, I am gonna zoom in for you. Up here, you can see burnt house right on the edge of the map. That's where the Dykeman, where the uh, newer Dykeman house would have been. When I say newer, I mean of those two ancient houses. So this would have been maybe Jacobus's or William's house, but it says burnt house surrounded by orchard. That's one of the Dykeman homes. It is gone in 1778. This is a really interesting map at the, at the Library of Congress. And we can see this is looking south there's Sherman Creek. We can see Broadway, Fort Tryon, Fort Washington, Fort George, Broadway kind of veering along the Harlem River. And here, go to the next slide and close up. It says houses burnt by the rebels. We know that one of the diamonds was um, selling to the ground. The Jacobus diamond was 
selling to the British, did he anger American forces? Then this Jacobus' brother was told by British guys that he was angry at the British. So there's a complicated story here. A guy named Schleberger in 1976 says, Fat farmers found it hazardous to sell to the British, not only in the transaction, but because of the danger of reprisals by patriots. Was the Dykeman farm burnt by rebels in reprisal for Jacobus selling food to the British? Or was, or was it destroyed by the British for Jacobus's brothers fighting for the rebels? All right, here's another map that shows, I'm going to do a close-up of it. On this map, one of the Dykeman houses has burned down and one remains. Because there, here's the Nagel house and the Dykeman orchard with one structure instead of two. And then by the end of the war, the final map in 1782, all the Dykeman structures are gone. Anyway, people always ask, what happened to the original Dykeman house? We're trying to figure it out. And uh, finding new maps, finding, uh, it's really amazing how the institutions digitize their collections and new things. New things are coming online pretty regularly. Some of these maps, this is from the British uh, headquarters map that's in a museum in England. The previous one was from a, from a, a library in Michigan and the Library of Congress as these institutions uh, keep scanning their stuff Maybe we'll actually find an answer. First apartment buildings in the neighborhood. Hut camps. This is a painting, a 20th century painting of what um, Inwood looked like. This is Inwood Hill. And uh, these are excavations that were done just a couple of blocks this way. Oh, that is motion detected. Anyway, there's a hut here that we recreated that actually has a Revolutionary War fireplace in it, the actual fireplace. And uh, these guys built these barracks all through the neighborhood, and they show up on maps. I put yellow rectangles where to make it easier to see. So in 1777, we can see barracks all over the place, and the new route of Broadway is already on the map. Where, where are we right now? We are like right here. The original house is here. And uh, so these are where these are they talk about they say what the map says what barracks and what uh, rather what troops what army or what division was there and it changes through time you can see as the British need to reinforce different places they change here's the Dykeman farm hut camp that's the one that the painting is of it's right over here below Dykeman Street or around Dykeman Street and and then along Broadway, heading up towards, uh, this would be 225th Street right here. So we can see all along Broadway, pretty much, uh, would have been these hut camps, they call them, where uh, six or eight soldiers would live in each one, and uh, they would need food. 1781, you can see that these hut camps have gone, and they've moved closer to the river. And more along the ridge top, along Fort Tryon and Fort Washington. And then in the last one, they're just reinforcing Fort Washington. So stuff is always happening up here. Uh, the generals were re strategizing and moving their uh, soldiers around constantly. And the soldiers' diaries reflect that. The height. It's all within five years. So they might have been a year apart. The excavation that happened on Payson Avenue um, was done by uh, uh, archaeologists. And so they actually drew maps. And this is a, this is a, published in the New York Historical Society quarterly. So all along Payson Avenue, they, were, they excavated 60 or 70 of these huts to the point where they could map them out with precision. And they learned that they were built with precision at a certain number of feet apart and a certain number of uh, feet per hut, generally square feet. So uh, 
just uh, west of Seaman Avenue along, along the line of Payson were 40 or 50 of these huts. And one of them had a fireplace that was so intact they decided to move here. What's the square there in the middle of the big structure? This that's a farm. That's a, it's just called McQuaid's, oh. somebody's house or somebody's property. We probably didn't let them excavate in there, so it was a blank. So, sorry, I have a question. So, how far apart these huts were from each other? Or... When the when the archaeologists were uh, excavating these things, they got familiar enough. They used these sounding rods, long metal, like iron rods, and um, the floors of these huts were packed dirt, and then an orchard grew over them, and so the dirt on top of the floor surface was loose. And so they would poke these metal rods down through the just the loose earth. And once it hit something, they do is either a rock or the floor of a of a hut. Yeah. And so they they I mean they got attuned to how it could be. You know, what felt like what? Was it a rock? Did it feel like a rock? What if it was perfectly flat over the course of a few feet, they know it would be a floor, it wouldn't be a round bowl or something like that. If it starts to intuit these things. And so they weren't digging random. After a while, they didn't have to dig randomly. They figured, well, the next one is probably there. Well, the next one is probably there. What did we bear on the barracks? Hmm? What did we bear on the barracks? Yeah, you could call them barracks. You could call them the first apartment buildings of the neighborhood. Uh, it was just soldiers. It was just soldiers. How long did they see how long ago? They were done in 1900 to 1910. Yeah, yeah. Most of these uh, archaeologists were um, amateurs. They were working on Sundays, and what they and the reason they had access to this property was because the roads were being built all over the neighborhood. In uh, in anticipation of the subway arriving, the streets were on maps in the 1800s, but they were just uh, theoretical streets with surveys, but they weren't physical, they hadn't been built. So what the, what would happen is the bulldozers would raid Seaman Avenue. And then on Sunday, these guys would come and look. They would find all kinds of stuff, coins, muskets, bones, campfire detritus, uh, wine bottles or rum bottles, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so then they started spreading out from, you know, asking property owners, can we dig here? This looks like a prompt, looks like a great spot. So in this one, if you look at the close up of this one, it says removed to Dykeman House. And that is what the fireplace looked like when it was being excavated. It had the, uh, I don't know what these things are, but it's like a lintel over the, over the, where you hang a pot. And the stones, so it was taken apart, stone by stone, numbered, mapped, and and rebuilt in there. So one of these huts still exists. You got the outside of the hut that's modern wood, but the inside of the hut is original. And some of these um, maps show the whole kind of community of things that needed to be that you needed to have in order to have a lot of barracks up here. You needed to have bake houses. Where they would bake bread. You needed to have stables. You needed to have a lookout called a blockhouse. You needed to have a hospital. And then all these things show up on the maps of Inwood. And here's Sherman Creek, that's Dykeman Street, if you want to orient yourself. So this is uh, Fort Washington up to Dykeman Street. And these are all the things that are in here. As these archaeologists excavated, they found bake ovens underneath apple trees in an orchard. So you can see all the bricks of it that would be the base, the bottom, the cooking part of a bake oven. Hard to say exactly what this is, but they found four, three or four bake ovens just above Payson Avenue. Gardens in the neighborhood. Um, some of the soldiers in their diaries, this is a, a Hessian soldier who was hired by the British, Von Kraft. He says in 1781, there are a few places in camp, there are a few places in camp which have not been made into gardens. I had two pretty spots near my hut in which I raised almost all the 
necessary vegetables with seeds I procured downtown. And then at the end, towards the end of the summer in August, he goes, our gardens were very useful. Almost like little green markets, right? And with so much water around the neighborhood, another thing of the sort of infrastructure of having a lot of soldiers up here were extra ways to get across the river. And we could see their ferries and pontoon bridges and regular bridges, sometimes temporary bridges all through the neighborhood. Let's get a close up of this. This is going across from Inwood Park, uh, like a, around the line of 218th Street across the river and uh, just by Dival. This would be around where the Sea Rock is now. And ferries would take people across the river too. Here's actual uh, a, a letter to a ferryman dated 1777, Mr. Tippet. There's a Tippet's Creek in the Bronx. And he says, this is uh, after the British are, are, have taken over North Manhattan. He is directed, you're directed by Major General Tryon to take charge of the scow that communicates with Spike and Devil and to the ferry and to ferry over troops when wanted, but you are not to pass over any person who does not belong to the army. So here's a bridge that are at 200, 200 Street, up at 225th Street, 230th Street, and then this other one that was a temporary bridge across to the Sea Rock. Uh, soldiers need to buy stuff too. So there were sutlers. Sutlers was the, like a, a, a general, a general store salesperson who would bring a wagon around and sell bands and stuff. Well, some wives, soldiers had their wives. Uh, soldiers had servants, some soldiers had enslaved people who lived with them, and children too. Women were generally relegated to domestic work, uh, nursing the wounded, or sewing, selling supplies at a sutler shop, or herding sheep and cattle. Washerwomen was the most common occupation in camp. About 4,000 British wives had come, which forces to America, and 1,000 German wives. Women served throughout the course of the war. So, we wanted ads for uh, sales salespeople, uh, sutlers who were civilians who sold general goods, outside by the army. Like, like uh, anything that I do, there was a lot of work. So, here's a wanted in 1777 in the New York. Wanted to meet a sutler, so just fancy for great gig. And camped at camp. So they were looking for a kind of stuff to sell because the soldiers needed some stuff. All right, another battle takes place on the 31st, 1778. The Battle of the Camp Militia, the Stock Ridge Native American Militia. In Portland Park, quite a Newspaper saying Monday night about 40 of our troops were drawn into an ambuscade and ambushed by the enemy of Fort Independence and taken or killed. About 20 of them were Indians. Among slain with an Indian of note, Chief Nimham. Here's the battlefield in Van Portland Park. That's 242nd Street and Broadway on the side. And on the Upper East Side of the park is the Indian field and a historic marker in the battleground. Basically, what happened was that the, the uh, Native American were fighting for the Americans were ambushed by British forces. The uh, Native American soldiers were beaten, and they were outnumbered and slaughtered on both sides. So when Chief Daniel Newham saw the Grenadiers closing in, he called out to his people to fly. To fly, run away, that he himself was old, too old to get away, and he would die there. There's actually a, a plaque there that seems to be that there's recent uh, flowers and stuff that posted there. On August 31st, upon this field, Chief Nimham and 17 Stockbridge Indians as allies of the Patriots gave their lives for liberty. It's really worth checking out. 
1778, the forage office is requiring farmers to turn over their straw. Farmers on New York Island are required to thresh out their grain and as straw for want of use of His Majesty's troops. One poor German soldier spends the top Christmas at Top Inwood Hill, and here's what he said. They called it North River Hill then. I was detached to a hill called North River Hill, where there was a fine redoubt at Fort Camden. Very good command it was, very comfortable, pleasant, and undisturbed, because no staff officer ever troubled himself to climb up to it. And his diary entry on the 25th is Christmas holiday. I was detached without bread on North River Hill. No bread could be procured, not even for money. I sent an orderly way over to the English bakery in the Bronx, and he found a loaf of bread for me. And that was my Christmas holiday. I guess a few of these slides are just to show that there was a, a little bit of connection to the city. Soldiers did get leave. And so there was a twice weekly stagecoach to downtown that left from Kingsbridge. For the British soldiers, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are no American soldiers here. Yeah. Um, people often asked, did the African Americans fight in the revolution? And there's one record that I found in April, from April of 1777, about 20 black British soldiers being stationed at Kingsbridge at 230th Street. And here we can see the British force stands thus. And this is a much bigger uh, table, but at Kingsbridge, under these commanders, he can say he, they list 20 Negroes at Kingsbridge, uh, Light Horse Brigade, soldiers under Joris Campbell, 180 under Major French. Most of the African Americans who fought were uh, fighting for the British. They have been promised freedom if they were enslaved and were fighting for the British. Uh, some of the, here's a, a, an ad from 1782. Hessian soldiers in the neighborhood sometimes had enslaved people in their camps. And here's a, so, a, a, a want ad saying, run away from Laurel Hill. That's Fort George. That's just the, the Low Dykeman Street on the east side. Run away from Laurel Hill Sunday night, the 20th. A Negro boy, 14 years old, called a slaved teenager in a Hessian regiment, liberate, liberated himself. Okay, so all of this uh, neutral ground stuff was managing to distract the British enough that they decided to move their reinforcements from around the island to right across the island. They built this barricade right across Manhattan at 192nd Street. The diary, the, this Van bon Kraft, the diarist, he says, in May 18, 1779, I was detached to erect a battery atop of the hill near Fort Washington, Kennebhausen is what the British called it. And then subsequent diary entries are all about taking down these forts one through eight, moving them all. It's like the British are retreating onto the islands to consolidate their forces there. Guns removed from Fort Independence in August, September, Fort Number Six torn down, uh, Fort Independence beginning to be torn down, the Watch House of the King's Redoubt is being torn down, and they're consolidating their efforts into this barrier across 192nd Street. You can see it pretty clearly. And let's uh, take a closer look at, this is a superimposition of today's Broadway, Nagel Avenue, Hillside. And, uh, and we can see the fortifications crossing Broadway right around where 192nd Street would be. They called it Barrier Gate. All of these walls and, and um, fortifications required lumber, and so did soldiers during the cold winter months. So most of North Manhattan was deforested. It didn't look like it does today. Inwood Hill was devoid of trees. You can see the top of the island. George Washington says this in 1781. The top of the island is totally stripped of trees and wood of every kind. Bushes as high as a man's waist appear in places that were covered with woods in 1776, the last time he had been here. Because the constant supply of wood was needed for huts, camp buildings, guard houses, barriers, daily heating and cooking, repairs, bridges, tables, chairs. 
Von Kraft wrote in 1780, the whole neighborhood was in comparison to last year, quite unrecognizable, the woods and bushes having been cut away. This map that he drew, which is kind of hard to read, but this is something that's very clear. You look at you, he says, garden, cut down, for barricades. That's one of the orchards that belong to the Dykemans. Cold winters, these were um, grips to put underneath your shoes to keep from slipping on the ice. The winter of 1779, 1780 were unusually severe. So severe that sleighing happened up here. Sleigh rides at Fort Kennephausen, that's Fort Washington. But military action continued to happen here. And the rebels cut loose this pontoon bridge across 201st Street. They uh, went right up, they uh, cut it loose from here. It floated down stream, stream. And when, the, then when the, the attack began, of course, the British noticed and started to fire their alarm guns, but it was too late. The British couldn't follow the rebels because they had detached the bridge. There's no way to get across the bridge. The United States' army was the French, and they finally arrived and met with George Washington's troops in the summer of 1781. Their decision to make was where to attack that would change the, the tempo of the war and maybe turn the tides towards the American forces. They thought about the French forces and American forces attacking here and taking retaking New York. The other option was Yorktown in Virginia. Of course, they chose Yorktown. But they came here with all of them. That's okay. The French troops and the Americans are sitting here, or rather just outside of here. And before that, George Washington scouted the area. And hang on. There we go. So in July of 1781, George Washington attacked the Patriots, 230th Street, in a skirmish with his lifeguards. That was his secret service. And in this record from July 11th is the accounting of the killed, wounded, and missing from His Excellency's Guard in the late skirmish at Cambridge. And here we can see the casualty list. Somebody wounded, some lost an eye, some had a neck wound. Someone had a bayonet wound, um, one missing, and three dead. 14 rank and file wounded. And so this was in preparation for the French arriving. Rochambeau and Washington's grand reconnaissance of North Manhattan. They did the same thing that George Washington did in a small scale in 1777. They showed their faces to see what would happen, and then they made maps to see what the British would do. So here we can see the American and French forces, thousands, thousands of soldiers on the hills overlooking Inwood, out of cannon shot, sitting down on the hills and letting the British fire at them and watching how the troops move. So here in red are the British forces, in blue are the American forces, and white are the French forces. Two of the Westchester guys who were Dykeman's, Mike Dykeman, was, he worked for the French. Brom Dykeman was a guide for the American forces. They made many maps. George Washington's diary restarted right around this time, and he talks about the neighborhood. 18th of July, within the mouth of Spite and Devil, Spike and, Spite and Devil, the way up to Cox Hill, which was uh, what he called Inwood Hill, seems difficult. The first part is covered with bushes. There's a better way up, but it's exposed. On the 21st, he says, 5,000 men are ready. The army arrived at Kingsbridge about daylight and formed on the heights of Fort Independence. On the 22nd, he says, the enemy did not appear to know that we were opposite them until the whole army was ready to display. I began with General Rochambeau and the engineers to reconnoiter the enemy's position from, from Tibbetts Hill on Spite and Dial. And he, then he has some strategic things to say. Having finished the reconnoiter without damage, a few harmless shot being fired at us, we marched back and arrived in camp about midnight. 
George Washington wanted the attack to be here. He wanted to retake New York. He thought that would change the balance of the war. Rochambeau thought it would be better to attack Virginia at Yorktown. And it turned out that Rochambeau was right. <laughs> so here's one of the maps made by the French in 1781. And we can see Redoubts Abandonne. So you can see the abandoned British forts surrounding their retreated position and the wall that they built across Manhattan at 197 Street. The American soldiers finally met the British soldiers. And we think of the American soldiers as a ragtag bunch and the French as like a professional army, a European army. And it's true, the American soldiers envied the French soldiers. Here's Joseph Rouse in one a letter to the editor in an old newspaper he says 6,000 French joined General Washington, and they are as good looking soldiers as can be. They look much better than our lousy army, which has neither money nor clothes. <laughs> and here's a drawing of what a French soldier might have looked like. Anyway, so there was uh, starting to be, the British were starting to actually worry a little bit. There were a lot of deserters at the forts in this neighborhood. And in October 1781, some deserters were hung in effigy at Fort Knickhausen, that's Fort Washington. And Von Kraft, who was fighting for the British, says several desertions having occurred among the Hessians, a gallows was built in order to excite fear. And the notification that the British wrote was to themselves, an internal memo was approved that officers Fuhrer, Kleinschmidt, and Mikkel, which to be hanged for treason and desertion to the enemy, and that their effigies be hanged until the persons now absent shall fall within the reach of justice. So they hang dummies as a message to the rest of their soldiers. But uh, the writing was on the wall and the siege of Yorktown, September to October, 1781, sealed the victory for the United States. Uh, one last kind of funny story, but this is interesting. A future king of England was here during the during the Revolutionary War. The spare prince, William Henry, he wasn't the heir, he was the spare of King George. And so since they didn't expect him to ever be needed as king, uh, he was sent to New York. And uh, he kind of had fun. Maybe he wrote some intelligence letters to his dad. But it was a he annoyed George Washington enough that he George Washington authorized an unsuccessful plan to kidnap the prince. He stayed in New York for months, and he became king because his brother became king on the death of King George. But then, brother didn't have any legitimate issue; he didn't have an heir. So then, his brother dies young, and this guy becomes king. This guy didn't have any legitimate children either. So when he died, his Cousin Victoria, I think, became queen. Or his, the third brother's kid. Anyway, on October 8, 1781, he inspects in. At the head of 5,000 men, the Prince of Wales came to the heights and passed the Morris Jumel house at about 10 a.m. His arrival near Fort Washington was marked by salutes from its guns, and the Prince marked, marched down through Inwood. This is from Bolton's book in the 1920s and over the Kingsbridge as far as Woodlawn and Valentine's Hill. And then he marched back again. There was no fighting. However, he viewed the defenses which had cost his country so much blood to acquire and so much labor to retain. On October 24th, news of the Yorktown victory reached England. Von Kraft, who was stationed up here working for the Hessians, said all day and night we heard loud and continuous gun and musket firing from the rebels, the origin of which at first we did not know. But shortly thereafter, we heard with sorrow that Lord Cornwallis had been taken prisoner by the French and the rebels in the South, where besides the English, the Hessian regiments were also captured. So news reached Inwood pretty quickly in October. This is a story that I just found out about. The, and it's a, it's a story of, about the Dykeman brothers trying to attack the Morris Jumel House. Have you ever been to the Morris Jumel House? It was, uh, yeah, it was, it's at 158th Street about. 
And um, it's a stately mansion. It's older than the Dyke and House. It was used as the British headquarters during the war for the generals. You know, you live in luxury. Everyone else can live in a hut. So a lot of their and um, a guy named Captain Williams had been taken prisoner, and the British refused to release him in an exchange. So Brom Dykeman, of course, the reckless Brom Dykeman, formed a plan to cross the Harlem River at night and capture British officers at the Morris House, now Madame Jumel's, in order to exchange them for Williams. And with his brother Michael and Jacobus, who lived here, and others, they made the attempt but found the ice crossing the Harlem River too weak. Boiled by winter ice again. That was the opinion of all but Brom, who was desirous of making the attempt. This is an oral history from the 1840s from someone who was there. While deliberating, Andrew Corsa, the 16 year old who had been a guy that we saw his photo of earlier, informed them that there was a British officer at the house in Fordham near Macomb's Dam, which is at 155th, was at 155th Street, about. So they surrounded the house, took the captain, McAvoy, prisoner. And Dykeman immediately paroled him in an exchange, like an honor system. We'll let you go if you promise not to fight. So Dykeman immediately paroled McAvoy, saying, we are willing to trust you. Send Captain Williams back to us. And a few days later, McAvoy honored that, and Williams was sent home. One of the final acts of heroism of Ron Dykeman, because just a month later, he was killed. On March 3rd, 1782, rebel forces attacked loyalists near Fort Number 8. And Cornelius Oakley, Brown Dykeman, and about 20 other rebels led the attack. The enemy was completely surprised, dispersed, but then reformed to chase the rebels. Although the Americans were defeated, retreated with their prisoners, it wasn't long before Delancey and his, and his refugees overtook them in East Chester. That's just at the five-mile limit for us. Exhausted by the chase, they all paused to rest. And this is where Brown Dykeman made his fatal mistake. He wheeled his horse, advanced with his saber, and said, come on, fight! He might have said something different, but he brandished his sword, and an enemy rifleman shot him. Mortally wounded, Brown barely managed to stand his horse. His brothers, Jacobus and Michael, kind of hurt herded him together and drove him off to safety, but he died from his wounds just a couple of days later on March 9th. Such a, such a sad story because the, the, the war had been decided by this point. And this was all just end, ending events. So it's not really over, but it is over. In the last event of the neighborhood that was a battle, in early July of 1782, rebel forces invaded southern Westchester, which at that time, well, that's the Bronx, and, the, and pushed the British back into Manhattan, except for the fort. A party of our men, this is from a 1782 newspaper, a party of our men, about a thousand, encountered the enemy at Spite and Dial. A se severe engagement ensued, which terminated with the retreat of the enemy. Our troops now have possession of all the country down to Kingsbridge, Morrisania, the South Bronx, along the coast eastward. New York Island appears to be the nobles ultra of the British and their friends. I like that use of the word. And a number of the Tories who lived near Kingsbridge fled in great haste to the city. So that's really the end of the battles. And now there's almost a year to go before peace really was declared. So in August of 1782, both armies are quiet and soldiers are wondering what's going on. In the Connecticut Courant, uh, De December of 1782, the correspondent says, the troops are in camps between Kingsbridge and Greenwich, but both armies remain quiet with no appearance of hostilities, which makes us think here there was some negotiation going. And in November 1782, the British started demolishing their last fort on the Bronx side of the Harlem River, number eight. We learn from New York that the enemy are demolishing number eight near Kingsbridge and that Delancey's corps, which were quartered under its protection, are to take a safer position 
on and half. March of 1783, news of the American independence, but not peace, arrived. The long expected packet boat arrived to New York by which we learned that the English had granted the Americans independence, but not to leave the country entirely until negotiations with France and Spain had been completed, because it wasn't just negotiating American independence that was happening. That's what von Kraft said in 1783. Really great portrait here of the negotiation of the Treaty of Paris. And we can see the American team, including Benjamin Franklin, but the British refused to sit for the portrait. So the portrait was never completed. November 21st, 1783, the British abandoned Inwood. And they notified George Washington they were going to do it. The officer, Carl Guy Carlton, writes this note to George Washington. Sir. His Majesty's troops will retire from Kingsbridge and McGowan's Pass on the 21st, and I shall resign the, the possession of Long Island the same day. Paulus Hook will be relinquished on the day following. So now that battle's over, there'll be 40 again. And the day before the British evacuated New York City, George Washington prepared to uh, march down Broadway from Kingsbridge all the way down. Town. It was on evacuation day the next day. And there was one person there who wrote his impressions on George Washington and as he passed through in. General Washington and Governor Clinton went as far as the Blue Bell Tavern at 181st Street on the afternoon of the 24th, where they awaited the advance of the American force, which passed the military and civic chiefs in review at the Old Tavern. And Major Robert Burnett, who was there, said, I remember our march up the hill to 181st Street. I'm just adding in the street names. And the noble appearance of Washington as he sat on his horse in front of the Stone Tavern, about two miles below the King's Bridge. Governor Clinton was by his side. All had their heads uncovered as we passed. Then they wheeled and followed us to our camp in Harlem. It was almost sunset when we passed the tavern at 181st Street. We marched at a quick step after that and pitched our tents at dark. I remember that night, the password was peace. Poignan. And this is Washington arriving in downtown Manhattan the next day. And a few years later, great image of the flag being raised and the British flag being taken down. So after that happened, this neighborhood was totally destroyed. The Dykins, when they finally returned in 1783, found a just destroyed farm. The farm was totally destroyed. They had to take out a loan to rebuild. They salvaged stuff from their old houses to build this one, which was done finished within a year, although it didn't look as nice as it does now. It was basically a roof and a floor, and uh, no porches, and um, no summer kitchen. But uh, they found a way to make a new life in this neighborhood. That's the end of this story. I wanted to leave you with this. This is the earliest photo of the Dykeman House that we've ever seen as of yet. It's from 1870. Next month, we're going to tell the story of the Dykeman House from when it was built, from the first map it appears on how it appeared and the people who lived there and through, through, through today and even into the future, we'll uh, use them to make some predictions. Because next summer we may be having, we'll see, knock on wood, some repair work done on the house, uh, make it accessible for ADA ramps. And so people have a hard time with those steep stairs getting in. And so uh, the future of the house looks bright. I wanted to point something out, but Broadway is at the level of the house here. Because in the 1890s, uh, when the streets and the archaeologists were all here, different grading, different uh, uh, rules were in effect for the building codes and how steep a street could be. And so it was determined to lower Broadway by about 15 feet. So that's what it is today. But this is the only image we've got of the original dirt, mud, original path. Of, that's actually not the original path. This was the military road that was a desire line in the, in the Revolutionary War. 
anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you are able to take some stuff away from this. Um, I think that uh, the story of the neighborhood is an undertold story, and it's a really interesting story. So thanks again. And if you have any questions, come find me or uh, let me know. Oh, yeah, we have some online questions. Yes. Okay. Um, how many of the fortified brick or British forts, the ones that like that were numbered, are still standing, if any. This is historic plaques. There's a fort, there's a, there's a, that's some slides that I, I, would, I used to have them. Um, fort Independence has a historic plaque. Fort number four has a historic plaque. Uh, the signs for Kings Bridge, the site of Kings Bridge have plaques along Broadway out on near, the, the uh, Marble Hill houses, there's a plaque. And on St. Stephen's Church, there's a plaque. Um, there are a lot of these forts that actually are now just apartment buildings, and they are there's nothing left. There's really nothing left of anything. I guess that's the final <laughs> answer. Except for except for plaques thing on this spot like, was built. What's next? Um, are there any evidence of an artillery camp near the National Parks? Artillery camps? Yeah, like any, like, artillery. A lot of cannonballs have been found in the neighborhood. I think that uh, the artillery was on higher places and not so much in lower places. So the artillery would have been on top of George, on top of uh, well, Washington, even on top of Marble Hill. Uh, there was a redoubt that didn't have a number. It was called Fort Prince Charles. And Marble Hill is a steep hill, too. And of course, Fort Independence sets on, on top of uh, University Heights. So most of the artillery was in the high places. It's much easier to shoot down at a target than to shoot up at a target. But a lot of cannonballs found in this neighborhood. I think during the soldiers uh, whiling away the hours while they were being waiting to be sent to some other place to fight. Um, cannonballs were made of iron, they got rusty, they always had to be perfectly round. And so soldiers spent a lot of time making sure that their ammunition was perfectly round. Any, anybody here? Thank you. Thank come find you. me, come find me if you wanna, if you think about something else. <laughs>